Hey everyone, it's Bradley Rosa with the Broward Bar Buzz. I'm excited to have a good friend and longtime trial icon and now mediator extraordinaire, Hiram Montero. Welcome, Hiram. Always a pleasure to be here with you, Braulio. And I'm thrilled that you invite me to come here to have a conversation because we do this on social ga in social gatherings, but this is an opportunity to be able to communicate with a lot of people at the same time. That's the goal, my brother. Yeah, that's the goal. That's why we're here. So Hiram, as I mentioned, you've been an extremely successful trial lawyer, and that has translated into a successful mediation practice. What are you doing differently that has propelled you into being so in demand? I think the fact that I've, I was a litigator for 40 years, uh, starting my practice representing insurance companies and corporations here in Florida and in the state of Illinois, and then transitioning over to uh, the plaintiff's side, representing people that were injured, people that lost their lives in uh, motor vehicle accidents, aviation uh, disasters, aquatic accidents, and different types of accidents. I was able to, uh, f uh, close and personal, realize how uncertain a jury really is. You go into a trial, whether you're the defense attorney or the plaintiff's attorney, and you relinquish all control over the outcome of a case to six people. And I always like to say that these six people, wonderful as they are, they have two things in common. They have a Florida driver's license, and they really don't want to be there. <laughs> That's true. That's the, tr the truth. Yeah. They don't want to be there because if they can, f they, they try to get off being on jury duty because particularly if it's a long trial and you're going to have them there for a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, or more, you're asking people to step away from their routines in life, picking up their kids from school, taking them to soccer practice, taking their parents, if they're elder, uh, elderly parents, to the doctor for appointments. They're answering emails. They can't do that when they're in trial. They're listening to the evidence. They're trying to be good, civic-minded citizens, listening to the evidence, but at the same time, they've got their own lives to think about. So... It, there's a great amount of uncertainty. You really don't know how a jury is going to react to a, a fact pattern that's being presented to them over an extended period of time. And for that reason, I am committed to the mediation practice. And I bring to the mediation practice years of experience defending claims and years of experience resenting claims. And I, I always like to tell my clients uh, – in a mediation setting that I am there to build a bridge toward a settlement. But I can't do that without their help. I need them to help me build that bridge. And I'm committed to build, build that bridge because at the mediation, it is the last time that they have total control over the outcome of the case. And that's really why I am excited to be a mediator. It's the right moment in my life to do what I'm doing. I've enjoyed being a litigator. Believe me, I loved it big time. Uh, and um, now I'm at a different phase of my life, and I love being a mediator. I love bringing people together and building that bridge toward a settlement. So I never thought about it that way, that um, when you go into a trial, you are relinquishing all control. A hundred percent. To six people. Yeah. You can prepare for a case, Braulio, for years. You've taken a hundred depositions. You've summarized the depositions. You've taken notes. You've read the law. You've prepared your witnesses. You've prepared your client. You make your opening statement. The witnesses come in. And then it's all in the hands of a jury, how they take it, how they receive it. And oftentimes you have a judge asking, asking the jurors questions after a witness testifies. And it's interesting, sometimes a, a juror will ask a question you never really thought about. And, and it's an oh, 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 oh kind of yeah, question? An, like, whoa, oh, that's a <laughs> great question. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, yeah, it's, 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 uh, being a litigator is, is, is phenomenal. It's very rewarding because you're representing people and uh, you're, you're doing a good thing. So would you say to uh, your, co your colleagues uh, that are still doing trials that unless they are sure that they have a slam dunk, mediation might be the best way to go? 100%. Um, and no one 
really has a crystal ball. I, I can't tell you over the years how many times I would go into a trial without a doubt thinking this is what's going to happen. And you're always surprised. There's a curveball that comes from There's somewhere. always something that happens. There is any an attorney who tells you that he knows the out what the outcome of the case will be when he begins uh, opening statements or voir dire even before the opening statements. I think that attorney is 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 not looking at life re- realistically <laughs> uh, because no one really knows. Uh, you do the best you can and you have to for your client, but at the end of the day, you're leaving everything in the hands of six people, as I said earlier, and those six people are the ones that are going to decide this case. And, and that's it. That's it. So when you when you have the lawyers and the people that are representing come in to see you uh, to do mediations, mm-hmm. is there what's your process? How do you go about this? My first of all, I like to read anything they send me before the mediation, and oftentimes I pick up the phone and call before the mediation. I read everything. I um, I, I want to educate myself on the case. I listen to the presentation made by one side or the other and the other side. And then I I start building that bridge, going from one room to another. The most important thing is to find common ground from the get-go. The fact that attorneys are coming t- to see you to attend the mediation with their clients, they have one thing in common. They want to see if they can get this case settled. Yeah. So we start with that. And then we start building on all the different elements where I can establish common ground. And then from there, you you try to get that bridge put together. And uh, you have to make sure that the attorneys trust you. I am not a judge. I am not going to decide the case. And it's a confidential process. So what I discuss in one room with one group of lawyers, I'm not going to disclose in the other room when I'm talking to the other group of lawyers, but they have to trust me. And I am able to establish that relationship of trust. And once you establish that, they know that you will be an effective communicator for their point of view in the other room. And everyone has to be committed to the process. So I know it's confidential, but in more generalities, can you talk about you know, kooky, a kooky mediation that you've had uh, within the last couple of years that you, you've had to use some serious skills to build that bridge? I don't know if I'd call it a kooky mediation, but if I'm mediating a case with someone who has perhaps never gone to a mediation before. And are you talking about the lawyer? Themselves? The lawyer. Some There are some lawyers that maybe have not mediated before or have uh, mediated with, lo- uh, with mediators that are basically messengers. I'm not a messenger. I like to get very involved. And I want to be bring the attorneys with me to assist me in building this bridge toward a settlement. We're all participating in this process because at the end of the day it is in the best interest of their clients to get the case settled if you don't settle a case and you go to a trial you're going to end up one side or the other is going to appeal and then this becomes a much longer process the amount of money and time that you're going to spend in a trial when you can effectively represent your client and do the right thing for your client in a mediation setting and you bring closure to the case, close that chapter of your client's life so that your client can move forward. I think it's, 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 it's phenomenal. It's a great experience. I am totally committed to the process. I think it's the way to go, and I think you're going to see more and more cases settled during the course of mediation. Your advice to the lawyers out there to prepare them to help you when they when they get to that mediation? What, what would you advise them? Dot your I's and cross your T's and give me as much information as you believe that I need in order to effectively assist you in building that bridge toward a settlement. And during the course of the mediation, if I feel that I am not, 
I, I do not have all the facts that I need, I will ask questions, open-ended questions, sometimes direct questions, to elicit uh, the information and perhaps the documentation that I need to effectively assist me in building that process. And for the average person out there, the non-lawyer, yes. briefly tell them, explain to them how what they should expect when they're going through a mediation process and how to be better prepared. Because I think it's shocking when they first go in. Um, the mediation process is different from what they've seen on TV that, you know, trials they're expecting, whatever, parent nation, LA law, whatever new legal show, right? Non-lawyers. I always like to make the non-lawyers feel comfortable because most of the lawyers, are, they're familiar with the process. And most lawyers explain to their clients what to expect in mediation. But still, as the mediation begins, I'd like to the non-lawyers to feel comfortable. It's an informal process. It's a confidential process. And I want them to know that I'm committed to the process and that if they share something with me that they do not want me to share with others in the other room, I won't do it. So they're in control. I, want, I always like to have the non-lawyers know that they're the ones in control of this process. And I'm there to assist them. I don't think they know that. I think no. a lot of time the non-lawyer gets in there and they're looking to their lawyer to kind of guide them. I'm not sure that, that they no. know. The that client that's... is the one in control. It is your case, whether it's being defended or it's being prosecuted, whether you're the plaintiff or the defendant. It's your case. It's your company that is being sued. It is you. You, you are the one that was injured. You are the one that's representing the estate of your spouse or your loved one that lost his, their lives in this uh, accident and this mishap. So absolutely, the client is in control. The lawyer is, is, is just the conduit to bring the facts before a mediator and later before a jury. Well, let's stop the process at the mediation so we can bring closure. That's what I say. Yeah. So uh, on a lighter note. Yes, sir. Christmas Eve. Eve dinner. You're Hispanic. You grew up in Chicago, though, yes. and an Italian neighborhood. Look at that. So, are are, are you going to have rice and beans and pork, or the the, uh, the feast of seven fishes? Well, you know what? <laughs> I I kind of I prefer fish, <laughs> <laughs> even though I grew up eating uh, rice and beans and pork. Um, so we kind of do a combination. You know, what, it's funny at, at our house. My we often my wife likes paellas, so we often do that kind of a Spanish seafood combo, which is paellas, and we have bacalao and well, and, and, all, the and, all, and all kinds of things. Salted like cod, probably. of course, salted codfish. So uh, we do a combination. Uh, it's sure. it's we don't do a strictly Hispanic Christmas Eve. I would say it's more of a an American. Christmas Eve, where we bring in different foods that we fusion. like along the way. Yeah, it's a fusion. I like it. We are all products of this great fusion. Yeah. You know, the, the United States is is a the best country in the world because it really we are um, we are citizens. I, I always say Americans are work in, works in progress. What an American was a hundred years ago is not what an American is today. It's a good point. We're works in progress and. Um, you talking about the Hispanic community. Uh, Hispanics have been in American history since the beginning. Just go up to St. Augustine. That's and, true. Uh, right down up the coast. And you see that uh, the Hispanic community has been in the United States, if it is the United States, from the beginning. But I think the influence of the Hispanic community has become more pronounced over the last yeah. 40, 50 years. And uh, we are part of the entire American experience. Yeah. And um, we are part of the fusion that we all enjoy here. It's interesting you brought up that because I, I recently saw something about it. And I've never been to St. Augustine, but mm -hmm. supposedly there's a street called Aviles Street yes. there. That's my other last name. There you go. So it's just kind of funny. Serious. No. I mean, I'm Rosa, but my, other, my, my mother's name is Aviles. And when you're walking around the streets in the old section of St. Augustine, the, the Spanish culture is, is obvious everywhere. Yeah. And I remember going with my parents as a little kid. My mom and dad would say, remember, the Spanish were here before the English. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Too funny. Uh, 
So, uh, hi, how do uh, people get a hold of you if uh, they want to contact you? Well, if they want to contact me, our phone number is 954-799-5000. And, uh, your website. Am, your website. My website also, ma- monteromediation.com. Uh, that's a way to reach me as well. And uh, at our office, we're multilingual. Uh, I speak Spanish and Italian. I've, I've actually had mediations where I have conducted the mediations in Spanish. Wow. And uh, sometimes it's been a Spanglish where <laughs> one of the clients doesn't speak English well and only in Spanish, and we go back and forth. And the attorneys appreciate that. If you're representing a, a, a you have a client, let's say you're not, uh, you don't speak Spanish well, and you're representing a client that does speak Spanish or that Spanish is his or her dominant language, I think it's very important for that client to have a mediator there that he or she can speak to in Spanish so that he or she can really understand the process. Feel comfortable. And feel totally comfortable because, as I said earlier, when the mediation begins, you need to establish that relationship of trust yeah. with uh, with the client because that is his or her case. Sir, as always, thank you for coming. I enjoyed it. The pleasure is mine. Thank you so much.